Well, good evening to everybody. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Gertz, for this uh, very nice introduction. And um, uh, I feel, of course, very honored and pleased uh, uh, to be allowed to have the following conversation with um, His Excellency, Mr. Jose Ramos Horta. You've heard from uh, the CV the achievements of the Nobel Peace Prize laureate that there would be plenty of topics to fill this evening. Uh, we probably could go on until the early hours of, of, of next morning, but we won't do this. Don't be afraid. Um, uh, from what you've, you've heard, uh, the UN, the United Nations, has been playing and continues to play quite an important role regarding the professional activities of Ramos Horta. And uh, I thought we, we could start the evening with looking a little bit at the United Nations. Um, Switzerland is also a member of this organization since a few years. And um, uh, Mr. Ramos Horta, you have been heading one of the most important reform panels a few years ago, looking at the achievements, but also the challenges the United Nations faces with its uh, peace operations. And uh, I, I have read once this report, I don't remember every part, but uh, what struck me then and what I still remember is the importance which was given to the notion of prevention, of preventing conflicts. And if we are now looking around in today's world, we can get to the conclusion put in diplomatic words that there is still something to do in this field. So what, what do you think? You've been heading this panel for, for several months. You've had many discussions and, and conversations. You wrote this, this, this very interesting and actually also stimulating report. And now you compare it to what's going on outside in the world. How do you feel about this? Uh, good evening. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with you in Basel, uh, in Switzerland, uh, in answering uh, uh, the question. A, we have to be also uh, realistic in understanding the constraints, the limits, whether of the United Nations or any multilateral uh, institution. Uh, any multilateral institution or any national institution uh, such as uh, well, with the, a national parliament, a national government, or uh, a regional uh, body like the European Union, the European Commission, uh, how much can uh, uh, do to uh, influence, to shape uh, situations, whether regionally or internationally? because there are so many uh, uh, factors uh, involved, so many interests, so many different perceptions, uh, suspicions, uh, rivalries between, uh, uh, between countries. Well, look at even the European Union, you know, it's only 28 countries. Uh, how often uh, the European Union reach consensus on uh, difficult issues, uh, how often they disagree. And these are supposed to be countries with uh, common values, common interests. And yet, on some areas, there have been uh, tensions and conflict. One ongoing is there is lack of a common policy, common strategy in dealing with refugees. In fact, it is the issue of a refugee, or part of the issue of refugee, that uh, uh, really uh, changing, uh, exacerbating uh, tensions within uh, Europe. So, if you transport this to another body, 192 countries, where you no longer have a you know, uh, countries with uh, common experience and uh, shared values. When you have uh, one end, you have the US, 
the other you have China, you have Russia, and in between you have Turkey, you have Saudi Arabia, etc., etc., you have India. Well, so you can understand how difficult it is to forge a consensus, because only through consensus, you, and the consensus that cannot be for the sake of consensus. You cannot have consensus to the lowest common denominator that is becoming totally meaningless. So how can you have a, a substantive uh, consensus on critical issues, then you take action. So, so uh, uh, that's where uh, there we are. Uh, even on an issue like climate change, it was not easy to reach the Paris uh, Agreement. There were failures in some other previous meetings, you know, in uh, Copenhagen, for instance, was a disaster. Uh, uh, and uh, then finally agree in Paris, but, uh, you know, in view of the calamity that, uh, that we face, uh, it should have, uh, it, uh, we, we should have agreed on a maximum uh, increase of uh, one, uh, one centigrade. Instead, we had to agree with uh, two. Uh, well, uh, and then you have a superpower, one of the biggest emitters, now reneging on the climate, on the Paris uh, Treaty. So that's where uh, we are. What I was asked to do by the Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, I was not alone. Obviously, we are a panel of uh, initially 17, but uh, down to 15. You know, one person got very sick, and the other one had a promotion, so was busier, couldn't do, so we became 15. People with incredible uh, background, you know, all together, the 15 of us uh, had an accumulated experience of 600 years. <laughs> and uh, uh, someone did this calculation anyway. Uh, so my colleagues were really brilliant from different uh, nationalities. And uh, my role was only to manage the uh, the 15, because we had, the 15 had so some very strong personalities. I had a Chinese, I had a Russian, I had a French, I had a British, an American, uh, an Indian, a Brazilian, uh, a great African lady from Ghana, professor. I had a Tunisian, I had a Jordanian, uh, a Norwegian, and not a typical Norwegian, because she talked a lot. <laughs> and I, you, I always ask her, you know, uh, I know her well, Hilda. Hilda, are you sure you are Norwegian? And uh, she was always, uh, but brilliant, el eloquent uh, lady. She was a special representative of Secretary General before in South Sudan, in uh, one of the worst uh, situations uh, at the time and uh, today. And what did uh, we were asked to do? We were asked by the Secretary General to review all the UN peace operation experience practices of the previous 15 years since the adoption of another report called Brahimi report. Lakda Brahimi, brilliant Algerian diplomat, had been commissioned by Kofi Annan, if I'm not mistaken, produced a report in 2000 on peace operations. In 15 years ago, the, uh, the international uh, security landscape was different. Fifteen years later, what had been agreed, had been proposed uh, at that time to improve UN peacekeeping uh, operations changed substantially because we had uh, very sophisticated armed transnational terrorism uh, that uh, were no longer uh, like black and white in terms of uh, just hijacking, uh, blowing up uh, installations, but one that became uh, really transnational in every sense, including with the power to conquer and hold territory. Uh, then you have also situations of implosion of states, like South Sudan. A state simply imploded. 
then you have a car, Central African Republic, then the endless uh, UN peacekeeping in the Congo, the most expensive peacekeeping in the world, the longest, 20 years. Uh, 20 years, just the last phase, it goes back to Dag Harmajol. Uh, and till today, you know, Congo has been always in turmoil. So how can the, the international community address this? And I use the word international community on purpose. The UN is just an institution that was created to assemble all member states with a secretariat led by a secretary general whose title or whose definition of whose job in the you look at the charter it says the principal administrative officer uh, and yet uh, the common discourse is we talk about the UN the UN the UN and uh, as if the Secretary General and the people around him in the Secretariat, uh, I don't know the numbers, but a few years ago, 4,000 people working in headquarters in New York. Around the world, over 100,000. Uh, well, uh, he is responsible for the management, the administration, the function of the Secretariat. He may be, you can uh, claim that he is responsible to build bridges, Countries don't agree with each other. He should be the ultimate diplomat, the ultimate mediator to try to bring Russia and uh, the US uh, and the Turkey and uh, uh, other countries in the region to have a common uh, a position on Syria. Well, uh, it, uh, they have failed. So that's the role of the Secretary General. But who are the culprits uh, when things go wrong? And who are, who usually take credit when, or should take credit when things go well? Uh, well, uh, the member states, you know. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN doesn't command the sixth fleet or the seventh fleet. He doesn't hold the key to, uh, trillion dollars, you know, uh, economy. He uh, begged for money. We as member states, Timor-Leste is a member state, we pay a fee to the UN. Timor-Leste is probably one of the, the poorest and we pay zero, zero something percent. The US usually pay 25 percent, etc., etc. And then on top of it, you have a time and again, uh, you have a contributions to the various UN agencies. Uh, and, uh, but when you look at the United Nations peacekeeping budget, it's uh, very small in the scale of things. Uh, eight to nine billion dollars, the budget of peacekeeping, to uh, cover the cost of more than 100,000 UN peacekeepers, 70% uh, of which operate uh, in the African continent. And uh, yet, <coughs> countries like the US, particularly the US Congress, uh, complain about the excessive cost of the UN. A UN peacekeeper costs average $2,000 a month. A NATO peacekeeper average costs $20,000 a month. The UN peacekeeping budget is about eight, nine billion dollars. Just the cost of the air conditioning, you know, the, the bill of air conditioning for US forces in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, at the height of it was eight billion dollars a year, just to pay for their air conditioning. And yet they complain about the peacekeeping, the peacekeeping budget. So, and as a result, uh, of uh, politics in the U.S., particularly in the U.S., because uh, Europe in general much more uh, understanding, supportive of the U.N. Uh, so it's a constant uh, battle. So we produced this report. We made more than 100 recommendations on how to improve one particular aspect of the U.N. Uh, mandate, and that is on peace operations. It's very wide range. 
It has to do with prevention of conflict. It has to do with peacemaking, peace building. It has to do with mediation. It has to do with sustaining peace. And how you sustain peace? You have to be able to sustain development. Uh, so the UN, its agencies, the international community have to stay engaged in a particular country that is fragile so that the country doesn't collapse back to uh, conflict. And uh, that is more difficult you know, to get international communities to sustain their uh, engagement in a particular uh, fragile post-conflict country. So this I just told you, a whole set of problems that you probably totally discourage. <laughs> but this is just to start. And then maybe we can look at some better news or good news. Yes, and problems are also there to, to, to be tackled in one way or, or the other. So when you, when you mentioned the tremendous costs of um, military peacekeeping missions, you stressed in particular also the issue of, of air conditioning of, of certain soldiers. So when thinking in terms of, of prevention, I mean, if, if it would be possible to do more in regard to prevention, so meaning to, to act earlier on, on tensions, and, and very often the UN is well informed because they have very competent people in the field, uh, not necessarily all military, often also civilian missions. Um, so do you think that based on the report you, you, you wrote, it will be possible to, to strengthen this preventive capacity of the, of the UN? I mean, after all, um, everyone makes experiences and sees what works and what doesn't work. So now one might say, well, after so many decades of, of, of not only successes, maybe the time is right to, to change certain things, for example, to do more for, for prevention. Do you, you are still very close and you have many links to very important people in the UN system. So what, what are your, your impressions about this? Is it completely an illusion? Well, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, probably uh, in the history of the UN Secretary Generals, I would cite three who are outstanding in their intelligence, uh, brilliance. Uh, one is obviously Doug Harmajol. Uh, the other, I would say, Kofi Annan from Ghana. And uh, the other is Antonio Guterres from uh, Portugal. And uh, I, I, I knew Kofi Annan, I know Kofi Annan well, uh, but probably not as well as I know Antonio Guterres. And I never knew of the Dag Harmajol. You know, when he was Secretary General, I was still in a, in a Catholic mission boarding school. Uh, so. Uh, and uh, so, but uh, Antonio Guterres, besides being brilliant, a polyglot, uh, characteristic that I uh, admire a lot in leaders, and I think is compassion and uh, humility. He is someone who is very accessible, humble, and uh, someone who is, has the heart in his, in the heart in the right place. He cares about people, uh, and so you have to be there when you are in a. Uh, in any situation, any leader uh, uh, has to uh, be accessible, has to be open to dialogue, uh, has to be able to reach out to anyone, you know, not just other political leaders. Uh, so with Antonio Guterres, uh, the challenges are greater than uh, 10 years ago, uh, and, uh, you know, he is a bit unlucky that he became Secretary General inheriting a world situation that worse than five years ago. And uh, so he doesn't have great partners to work with on the international uh, stage. But if anyone can build bridges among the many um, uh, conflicting uh, powers, is uh, Antonio uh, Guterres. Now, Antonio Guterres talked about, he put emphasis, like us, on prevention. Easier said than done. 
Let's take a specific uh, situation, country A. Why country A imploded? Well, uh, it has to do with things like, you know, if, you, if a, uh, countries, uh, in, particularly in the developing world, where we are fragile, where there are a lot of inequalities, where the vast majority of people don't even have uh, access to clean water. Uh, it is then that the leaders have to be far more sensitive in avoiding rampant corruption, ostentation, uh, exacerbate social economic inequalities. And if you are in a country that is multi-ethnic, multi-religion, multi-culture, then you have to be even more careful in not making any particular group feeling excluded, discriminated. That is recipe for trouble. And the difficulty in our part of the world, in the developing world, is with some exceptions, Ethnic diversity, religious diversity is not seen as a blessing. You know, I look at a country with much diversity as a wow, that's great. You know, uh, and one great example, in my view, in spite of like Indonesia. Indonesia is 17,000 islands, 3,000 of which inhabited. The largest Muslim majority in the world, 250 million people. But they have a lot of ethnic groups. They have other religions besides Islam. They have Catholicism, Christianity, Buddhists, Hindus. And in spite of the many problems they face, uh, tensions, violence in, in the past, uh, Christian, uh, Muslims, by and large, it has been enormously successful. An example of a uh, a, an archipelago, a multi-ethnic, multicultural uh, country living together. And uh, the fact that Indonesia has stayed together in those, in that vast archipelago with so many languages, because they do have a national language, Bahasa Indonesia, but they have a, something like 300 other languages, of which 200 are in one island alone, uh, West Papua, you know, 200 are there for a people of only two million in uh, West Papua. A good example. India is uh, another, you know, in spite of all the challenges, problems uh, they face. But in others, they suppress other languages, minority languages. They suppress uh, indigenous cultures. Well, people fight. At one point, they fight. They can. Uh, low, low, lay low, they can surrender for a while. So we have all of this. So it's a failure in many parts of the third world. Why South Sudan imploded? Well, you had the president, the vice president, unable to engage in dialogue. They represent two distinct uh, tribes, ethnic groups. So in this situation, what can the international community, the neighbors do? So you have uh, neighbors who should be at the front line of helping their neighbor in trouble, preventing the exacerbation of the conflict. But unfortunately, in some of the situations like South Sudan or even Congo, neighbors are also part of the problem. Uh, and uh, in other situations, neighbors have been very helpful. In my own country, Timor-Leste, we have, we have great neighbors who always help. Uh, as uh, stabilizing the country, that's Indonesia, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, etc. But others are not so fortunate. And uh, I was in Guinea-Bissau, West Africa, with the United Nations for a year and a half. Even in that tiny country, there are so many uh, different interests in the region surrounding Guinea-Bissau. I had to travel all over West Africa, uh, talk. Uh, b building consensus among the West African countries. And uh, beyond, even beyond that, you had ECOWAS, 
the uh, regional organization for West Africa that had differences in relation to Guinea-Bissau with the African Union, the mother regional organization. At one point, I sent an uh, email to New York saying, am I here to mediate among the local people or am I here to mediate among external uh, actors? But to address the problem in Guinea-Bissau, we have to bring together the powers that be in the region. Even the European Union had different approaches to Guinea-Bissau. <coughs> You mentioned <coughs> different approaches one might have. Um, uh, you mentioned South Sudan. Mediation is also a field you have been active and you are now particularly active as member of this um, advisory panel of the Secretary General of the United Nations. So mediation has become very popular also outside of international politics if we have uh, conflicts in neighborhoods, in families, in schools, maybe also at the university, we, we go for mediation. If we now look at South Sudan, it, it didn't work, or maybe it wasn't even really tried, or it wasn't tried by the right persons. Um, you are now part of this advisory panel. I mean, what, what would we say? What, could be improved in terms of international mediation? Do we, do we not have enough mediators? The, the still foreign minister of Switzerland, only for a few more days basically, he, he believed a lot in mediation. He thinks the more mediators we have in international politics, the better the world will be. Do we have a lack of mediators or do we have a lack of parties ready to enter a mediation? Uh, well, you know, look at uh, Syria. There were no lacking of uh, mediators and outstanding individuals. It first started with Kofi Annan, who was asked by both Ban Ki-moon to mediate in Syria. Well, Kofi Annan gave up after uh, six months. Then came Lakdar Brahimi from Algeria. I call him a patriarch of diplomacy. You cannot find a more sage individual than Lakdar Brahimi. He survived two years. And then at the end of two years, he went on television, apologized to the people of Syria for his inability to bring the parties together to end the war in Syria. Well, I don't want to, uh, you know, to recite all the, the background that brought about to the tragedy of Syria. But in the case of Syria, uh, almost everyone made mistakes. I wouldn't say, not almost everyone, everyone made mistakes. Start with, let's say, the Syrian opposition, demanding simply the resignation, the withdrawal of Assad. You must go, you must resign, no negotiations with you. Well, the, the gentleman had his army intact and uh, for him is a matter of survival of his, he and his people, the Alawit. So you have that. And then you have dozens of uh, Syrian opposition groups. And then you had the Europeans, particularly France and the UK, uh, very triumphant after the Libya situation. You recall uh, how David Cameron and uh, Sarkozy went to uh, Libya as heroes because they threw NATO bombing of Gaddafi. Gaddafi was ousted. And they thought they could replicate that in Syria. Well, total miscalculation. Then, so miscalculation by everybody. Miscalculation by Syrian opposition, miscalculation by the international community, particularly the powers that be. And uh, then they forgot one detail, Russia. Why Benghazi happened? Why Libya happened? Why Gaddafi was bombed and uh, removed? because Russia and China 
finally agreed at the Security Council to allow a resolution to pass for humanitarian protection to prevent uh, the Libyan Air Force from uh, bombing civilians in Benghazi. Because you recall there were a lot of talk about bloodbath coming in Benghazi. So there will be a, a air interdiction of a Libyan Air Force. Well, that uh, humanitarian uh, resolution turned into regime change, major embarrassment to China and uh, Russia. They were not going to allow the repetition in Syria. So you have everybody miscalculated and created everybody. It then that you decide to call a doctor. And the doctor is Kofi Annan, another doctor was Lakda Brahimi. So uh, next to uh, impossible. And I didn't even mention regional actors, you know, the Turkey, uh, etc. Et and I have to say, you know, uh, in Geneva a few years ago, I was asked this question at the UN. I was on a panel with uh, President Martis Ar Martisari of uh, Finland. I was asked a question about uh, Syria, and uh, I had to give an honest answer. I said, I'm sorry. There are wars that will go on forever. People will kill each other. People will die. It will stop only when all sides are exhausted. This is what happened in Iraq, Iran war. When Iraq, Saddam Hussein invaded Iraq, we they invaded Iran in the aftermath of the Khomeini revolution. Saddam Hussein miscalculated, he thought it would be easy uh, to defeat Iran because Iran was in turmoil. Well, the war went on for eight years. Chemical, biological weapons used. More than one million people killed. Finally, they sat down and negotiated. But Iran-Iraq war was easier, compa, because you had two organized states. When Saddam Hussein decided to end the war with Iran, it ended on his side. When Iran decided to end it, but Syria is very different. You have uh, more than 100 armed groups. Then on the other side, you have uh, Assad. And then you have all the regional interests. So that is the tragedy of our war. And uh, so what can we do? What can the UN do? If it were not for the UN as a coordinating agency, as a mobilizing agency, many more people have died in Syria. Many more people have died in South Sudan. It is the UN that at least provides some safe haven that mobilizes humanitarian support to save tens of thousands of lives. Many more would have died in South Sudan. It was the UN that opened the gates of the UN compound and rescued 100,000 people. Uh, so uh, that's the most the uh, UN have been able to do in the case of Syria, in the case of uh, South uh, Sudan. Uh, there are, so I have to say, uh, there are no uh, easy answers. We would have found the answers. And uh, if only Putin, the US president, together with Erdogan of Turkey, plus Jordan uh, as a neighboring country, you know, I have to say, you know, uh, some of the countries surrounding Syria, uh, Jordan, it has been extraordinary how they have been able to remain stable, survive in the midst of that uh, tragedy. They have a lot of refugees, Lebanon, a very small country, as you know, territory-wise and population. Half of the population now we are refugees. And yet the Lebanese are able to maintain that equilibrium inside, but extremely dangerous, you know. The weight of the refugees in Lebanon, the weight of the refugees in, uh, on Iran, on uh, Jordan, Turkey, very dangerous for these people, these countries. And yet they have been able to uh, Bringing all of these countries together, uh, maybe an early end to uh, earlier end to the conflict in uh, in Syria. But then don't forget the trauma, the youth, the children growing up. What is going to be with them? How they are going to react? The many thousands who are in Europe today, 
with their traumas. And if on top of it they feel discriminated in Europe, they feel unwanted in Europe, what generations of youth, of adults, we are creating, you know, for the future. Very dangerous. Yes, we tend to forget when we are looking at the refugees in Europe and also in Switzerland, we tend to forget that the countries in the immediate environment of the conflict countries, very often they have many more refugees to host than, than, than actually are in Europe. A little bit more than 20 years ago, you were awarded the Peace Nobel Prize. What, what was the significance of this award for you? Did it affect you emotionally, politically? Did it motivate you to do many other things you would not have done since then? I mean, what, what was the impact of, I mean, you know, maybe just to, to frame it differently, um, very often the question is asked, what's the Nobel Peace Prize for? You know, does it change anything in the world? So this is now a much more specific version of this question. I mean, because it's not every day we have a Peace Nobel Prize award sitting here. So what was the impact on you? Well, uh, with or without the Nobel Peace Prize, I began uh, speaking up for freedom uh, in my country uh, 20 years or 30 years before the Nobel Peace Prize. And I never even heard of the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> and uh, and uh, then came the Nobel Peace Prize. I was even shocked that uh, my name had been, uh, I had been nominated. I was even embarrassed. And uh, because I thought someone else uh, should have gotten it. You know, one of our leaders who was in prison, Shannon Guzman, I was only relaxed, happier when he phoned me. <laughs> and this, he said, well, the Nobel Committee couldn't have done, made a better decision. Then I was a bit more uh, relaxed. Uh, but forgetting about uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, I have given talks, God, hundreds of uh, talks, not only about my country, but you know, uh, all over the world. I get invitations, uh, small or big, I go. Uh, in June, I, I accepted an invitation to speak at a small uh, uh, event in northern Portugal. And I accepted it because I said, well, it's a great opportunity. I go there and I take five days off enjoying the north of Portugal. Because I love you know. <laughs> so that's an excuse for me to go there. Well, then everybody started inviting me. God, every small village, small town. So my five days completely disappear. I end up. <laughs> uh, well, people seem to enjoy listening to me. So I <laughs> but, let, but sometimes I ask myself, God, really? After all these years of me speaking on peace, Desmond Tutu speaking on peace, the Dalai Lama speaking on peace, and the world is getting worse. <laughs> I think something must be wrong with us. <laughs> so sometimes I said, no, I'm not going to anywhere again to talk about peace because things are only getting worse. So you get, you know, as a human being, you get tired, you get frustrated. Uh, but then I look at my country, you know, I have done my own contribution to my country, uh, focus on that, because I, I always tell people, I focus on my country, my, the best contribution for me to world peace, to world peace is that I help secure stability, peace in my country. And if each of us in our own country, we are able to secure peace, then it's a bit like building blocks of peace. Timor-Leste is part of this building block. Uh, it is our responsibility to our people and our responsibility to the world, in the sense that the world help us. And uh, so in 2009, I, was, I went to Washington. I had been invited a year before uh, by the, the US Congress for a breakfast meeting. I accepted. But in the meantime, there were elections in the U.S. in 2008, 
And then I thought, maybe I'm not going. There's a new administration, new Congress, who is going to pay attention to me? But I decided to go. And why did I decide to go? I said, well, every time in the past I went to Washington was because there were problems in my country. I go there to ask for help. I go there to, to look for sick this and that. But that particular year, I decided to go because my country was doing well, peacefully. Our economy was growing, double digit. And I said, no, I go now to share the good news with our friends in Washington. Because at the time, there are bad news from every direction. The economic financial crisis, the meltdown, uh, thing got worse in Iraq, Afghanistan. Well, let me share with them some good news. So at least in one corner of the world, things are well. On environment, I, I declined, I was president, I declined to go to Copenhagen. I knew it was going to be a waste of time. Besides Copenhagen, very expensive city. In, uh, a small room, you pay $500. I said, why, what, why am I going there to spend $500 just to sleep? And knowing that the conference, the climate change conference, is going to fail. I knew it was going to fail. So I didn't go. Uh, but I said, what should be Timor Leste contribution to the world on climate change, on environment. Well, that we, as Timorese, we plant millions of trees to save our forests, to clean our beaches, our seas, our lakes. That's what each of us should do. Uh, if in India, uh, in Thailand, in China, they were to plant tens of millions of trees to put back what was destroyed over the years. Well, that's, so each of us do. So that's how, uh, anyway, that's a long answer to uh, your question about the value of uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. For some situations, it put a forgotten people on the map. And Timor-Leste, yes, it helped highlight the problem of Timor, and it contributed to a resolution of the conflict. But the conflict re resolved only when there was regime change in Indonesia. Indonesian students went to the streets, the regime collapsed, negotiations took place, Indo the new regime agreed with a referendum, referendum took place, and we are freed. And I have to say, we have the best possible relationship with Indonesia. We are predominantly Catholic, 98% Catholic. Indonesia, the largest Muslim majority in the world. There are no two countries in Asia that have a better relation than Catholic Timor and the Muslim Indonesia. In 24 years of our struggle, on our side, not a single Indonesian civilian was killed. No kidnappings, no killing of Indonesian military who were captured by our fighters. Not one. Those who were captured were treated and then, uh, after a few months, sent back to, uh, on the road, back to their headquarters. We never demonize Indonesians as a people. We never demonize Islam. We are Catholics, Indonesia is majority Muslim, and we, and we never. And that's why after our independence, it was very easy to reconcile with Indonesia. Day one of our independence, we established diplomatic relations with Indonesia. We have thousands of Timorese studying in Indonesia. Thousands of Indonesians living, coming back to live and work in Timor-Leste. We don't need a visa to go to Indonesia. Indonesians don't need a visa to come to Timor-Leste. So that's ours and Indonesian contribution to all understanding to regional peace. Very different from, let's say, what's happening in uh, uh, Myanmar today uh, and in other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. You said that actually one should look for peace in his, her own country, and um, this would then build blocks up, and in the end, at least in theory, the world would be more peaceful than it is today. So this, this almost sounds Swiss as a perspective, because we do have many people in, in Switzerland, politicians, but also people outside the political sphere, who think, well, why do we care about far away countries in trouble, you know? We are taking care of 
our own problems ourselves. We don't export our problems, at least not in the political sphere. And um, uh, if everyone would behave the same way, this is actually the recipe for, for world peace. So, so you could almost apply for Swiss honorary citizenship, or what do you think? Uh, well, uh, great country, obviously Switzerland, because of uh, geography, because of history, uh, selfish interests of those who surround you, uh, you, and of course, you know, wisdom on the part of those who manage this country for centuries, uh, able to stay away from trouble uh, in Europe. So I have the greater respect for the people who created these entities called Switzerland. God, how they have managed this, you know. So anyway, great, uh, but uh, having said that, the example of ICRC, the International Committee of Red Cross, is one of the greatest invention in, uh, of humanity. Where no one else able to do, to go, they have gone there. And they are able to save lives. In my own country, for years in the past, it was ICRC, uh, sometimes only one doctor ICRC allowed there. Uh, so building on, on that, uh, on the ICRC experience, Swiss experience, yes, Switzerland can do even more. But not only Switzerland, you have other countries like Norway, small countries without imperial uh, history, without to, uh, selling weapons to, uh, <laughs> to people because, well, you know, uh, the P5, the permanent members of the Security Council, they are top of the list of weapons exporting countries. And uh, one, uh, one uh, 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 sector that didn't suffer from the world economic crisis was the weapons industry. Banks collapse, countries collapse, but the arms industries thrive in the midst of the wars in the Middle East, Afghanistan, everywhere. You see Saudi Arabia buying more airplanes, and the Americans get are very happy because the Saudis are buying more aircraft. You have even Qatar buying more aircraft. <laughs> so anyone who has money buying uh, weapons. So the weapons industry all over the world very uh, happy. Well, uh, small countries are not the ones making wars. The wars always come because of the uh, larger uh, powers. But it is incumbent on small countries where uh, larger ones lose credibility, uh, not view as an impartial mediator. So Switzerland can and should do much, much more. And, uh, but not only Switzerland, in other small countries like I mentioned, Sweden, uh, Norway, in our region, uh, New Zealand, a great country, far away from anything uh, uh, that you know. Uh, even during the Cold War, the Russians and the Chinese all forgot about New Zealand. They um, are very protected by by distance, and uh, so because I have to say, I mentioned it because New Zealand was one of the few countries in the world sitting in the Security Council in two, in uh, '94 that has an honorable uh, position in history. During the Rwanda genocide, it was New Zealand, member of, non-permanent member of the Security Council, that spoke out valiantly, tried to have the UN intervene in the Rwanda genocide, to stop the genocide, unsuccessfully. One of the uh, I say bad spots of Bill Clinton, he regret. It was under Bill Clinton, the Security Council didn't act. But also Kofi Annan. You go to uh, Kigali, uh, you visit the Genocide Museum in Kigali, in Rwanda, you see documents there that uh, is an indictment of some world leaders. But New Zealand, Small country, and the New Zealand is highly regarded in, uh, in uh, uh, Rwanda. So many small countries can have. My own country, you, you would be surprised. Uh, you know, we have a bit of oil and gas, starting in 2005. When I was in Guinea Bissau in 2013 to 14, it was my country that almost 
uh, financed two thirds of the electoral process in Guinea Bissau. We put there a total of $12 million. When Ebola happened, we were among the first countries in the world to donate cash to ECOWAS countries, $2 million. To, and, uh, because we felt, you know, we received a lot from the international community. We have a bit of extra cash because of uh, oil and gas revenues. Not much, but we do. So let's help back uh, uh, other, other countries in, in need. Uh, so, uh, you, uh, we, we about, uh, about Europe and uh, why uh, Switzerland should worry. I said, well, let me tell you, you know, uh, Europe, you have a, an aging population. I don't know how many uh, Europeans are on wheelchairs or are on social security. You know, you cannot work. Uh, the, the achievement of Europe that you live longer. You know, but you live longer, it means someone has to take care of the people who live longer. And as you live longer and you don't produce children, because very low birth rate, you lose competitivity, you lose productivity. And, uh, uh, and uh, because by and large most European countries are very close, unlike the US, everybody can criticize the US, but it is, of all the problems, it's still a land of opportunity. I'll give you an example. A few months ago, I was researching for a speech in Sydney on refugee and immigration. I came across a work done by a friend of mine in LA. She was commissioned by NASA to do some uh, short films about women in NASA. She focused on 14 women. And only when she finished the series, she realized of the 14 women, nine were immigrants or refugees. A woman from Myanmar, from a poor village, she left Myanmar age 14, went to the US. Well, she's one of the top engineers of NASA designing a helicopter to fly on planet Mars. A woman from Myanmar, and the footage show her village. Another one, survivor of killing fields of Cambodia. Another one, a woman from survivor of the boat people of Vietnam. Another one, a daughter of a Mexican maid working in the US. Well, what refugees and migrants have contributed to the well-being, prosperity of the rest of the world? The New York Times, you know, the venerable New York Times, very rich, almost collapsed 10 years ago. It was a Lebanese immigrant who left Lebanon, his small village in Lebanon, migrated to Mexico, became one of the richest men in the world. At times he was even richer than Bill Gates. He was the one who saved the New York Times. He bought the New York Times. So you have these extraordinary stories of immigrants, refugees, contributing to the well-being of the U.S., well-being of, uh, of uh, Europe. So, uh, and, and that's our, uh, and, and that's what, how you say, the positive uh, contribution of immigrants, refugees. Uh, so I would say, you know, pragmatism even, besides compassion, besides being wisdom, is to see what is the best approach, what the best uh, strategy that in the midst of the humanitarian catastrophe, you show compassion, but at the same time, being smart. How these people can embrace Europe, embrace Switzerland, embrace France, as many have done. And it's not only now, you know. Arabs have been in, uh, in, uh, in France, uh, Muslims have been in France, in England for generations. And look at their contribution. But then why some are angry? Why so many French citizens fighting with ISIS in Syria and Iraq? Why many Belgian citizens? Well, you cannot just use security to chase them. You have to understand why. 
Why Indonesia 250 million Muslims? There are only 300 Indonesian citizens fighting in Iraq and Syria. Why there are many more ISIS from France and uh, Belgium in Syria than uh, Indonesians? We have to answer this question. We have to. Yes, we should definitely do this. Um, but maybe not tonight. Um, uh, and uh, if, I, if I look at my watch, which doesn't have exactly the same time than the official watch of the room, this is the difference between Bern and Basel. Exceptionally, the Bernese are, are more uh, advanced than, than, than the people uh, here. But anyway, I think it's, the time is ripe to open up for, for um, questions. And um, we do have one or two microphones, one at least, but the very um, two, two microphones, very quick microphones. So um, I would now encourage you to to ask questions. I'm stressing the word question because sometimes maybe because phonetically it starts similarly to the word to the word comment uh, is another word, yeah. So, so try to ask questions to, to our, our guest. I mean, I think we should take profit uh, uh, from, from him tonight. You may say who you are or you may not. This depends. It's up to you. You may ask your questions in English. This is the easiest for all of us. But you may also ask them in French, which is also being understood by both of us here in the front. And you may even ask them in German, and then I will translate. So feel free to use the language, one of the three languages you prefer, and the, the width of the topics is, is open. Uh, you may go for international questions, more political questions in a different way. You may, you may try to ask personal questions. Everything is possible. So who dares to ask the first question? Yes, please, over here. Thank you very much. You were speaking before about uh, independence for Timor-Leste, and I'm wondering uh, how you weight the importance of armed struggle versus regime change in Indonesia in obtaining independence, and if you could place this in context with other struggles for independence around the world that are ongoing. Uh, maybe we take two or three questions. Yeah. Okay, we... we take two or three questions. Yes, please. Uh, I think you know some tradition, traditional uh, religions still struggle so that they could be considered to be religion in Indonesia. How do you suggest about the future of these traditional religions in Indonesia? Thank you. Yeah, when in the world? Tradition, the future of traditional religions in Indonesia. Traditional religion. Yeah. yeah. And maybe a third question in the close area. Yes, there's one more further in the back. Yeah. Traditional religion. The future of traditional religions. I know maybe, maybe. I would like to ask if <laughs> Mr. Ram Sorta has ever lost his passion. Sorry, I, I, I did. Could you just? I would like to know if Mr. Ram Sorta ever lost his compassion. Okay, thank you. If you ever lost your compassion. <laughs> so we have we have th three questions about uh, the possible loss of compassion, about uh, the the future of of traditional religions. Maybe you could just say one sentence what you mean by traditional religions, because I don't know any non-traditional religions. Yeah, in Indonesia, uh, we call it Panghaya uh, Kepercaya. They are struggling so far because the last religion who, uh, which is to be considered Konghucu. Konghucu religion is come from China, but for Indonesian indigenous people, they are struggling, they have traditional religion, but they are not considered to be religion. Okay, thank you. And then the, the 
the relation between um, um, regime change and armed struggle in regard to what happened yeah. in your country? Uh, in the case of uh, Timor-Leste, obviously we were a small country, small population, less than a million. Indonesia, one of the mightiest armies in Southeast Asia. Not many people believe that uh, we would ever uh, prevail. And in fact, one word I heard all forever was to be realistic. Uh, that Indonesia occupation of Timor Leste was irreversible. Uh, well, we just persevere. Uh, there was, we had armed struggle, obviously. It was not an entirely uh, peaceful uh, resistance like you have with Mahatma Gandhi in India. Uh, but uh, we had a very small uh, armed resistance uh, dimension. And, but that armed resistance had a very, very strict code of conduct that I mentioned earlier. No kidnappings of civilians, no touching Indonesian civilians. There are many tens of thousands there at that time. The school teachers, farmers, etc. So it was off limits. Uh, Indonesian soldiers captured many, captured, surrender, poor return. Uh, <coughs> and there was effort on our side to reach out to the Indonesian people. And there are many Indonesians who supported us. Some end up in jail in Indonesia because they are supporting the more or less. And we had Indonesian military who helped us. We had Indonesian military doctors who treated our wounded people because we didn't have a single doctor in the mountains. So uh, because of our attitude, uh, we wake a lot of sympathy in, in uh, Indonesia. But in the end, uh, we uh, prevail only because of conf confluence of many factors, including Indonesian people, particularly the youth, tired of the Suharto regime. Financial crisis in 1997-98 brought hundreds of thousands of people to the streets, and the new president of Indonesia, uh, uh, Fani Habibi, decided time to get rid of the Timor problem. So negotiation accelerated uh, under UN auspices. So it was not a single uh, factor. Uh, where, but armed resistance in my country was always like more symbolic because uh, no amount of damage we can cause the Indonesian army would change their policies. So the armed resistance was also political. The armed resistance had powerful symbolism for the people. Uh, but that's uh, the second about traditional religion. Uh, well, I, in my country, animism is a traditional religion, the animist faith. And what is uh, interesting in my country is that while in the past the Catholic Church was totally against the worship that come with animism. Uh, today, the Catholic Church, wiser, pragmatic, accepts the, the rit uh, animist rituals. You know, many of our very conservative, traditional people, particularly from the central region, they are formally Catholics, but they still have uh, the so-called Uma Lulik, the sacred houses. The sacred house was animist form of uh, worship. They go to the Catholic Church on Sunday or every day, but still worship the ancestors, the ancestors represented through objects that are there. And uh, so that's tolerance, you know. In Indonesia, I know there are much more difficulties on the part of uh, uh, certain uh, faith in Indonesia to accept the traditional religions that not only animists but uh, others. But beyond that, I really don't know and uh, I cannot uh, comment. Uh, third, 
Have I ever lost compassion? Well, uh, not, uh, no, never. You know, uh, as a human being, you know, whether in my own country with poor people or uh, in uh, uh, anywhere in the world that I'm able to help, try to help, uh, I do. Uh, if I can just help one single life, I help that single life. Because sometimes, you know, I try to help someone in Afghanistan, a child. And I did in the past, but I'm, I'm told, well, there are so many. You know, I, one day I saw a BBC story uh, and about how a family sold their 12-year daughter to a much older person to pay for the debt. The hour. For I was so angry. I did everything until I tracked down that family. And I said, no, I'm, I'm ready to, uh, to buy back the girl to deliver to the parents. I give the money. And uh, an NGO work in Afghanistan, they said, forget, there are many thousands like that. And there are thousands. And I was angry with that NGO, a well-known international NGO, for giving me that answer. Well, I know there are many thousands. I'm not stupid, I'm not naive. But at least I save one. And uh, so that's, uh, and if when we help someone, if I help someone, I'm telling you, I, I, I also win my happiness. I'm not just helping, you know, not only the other one is uh, win, I have won. When you help someone, I guarantee you, you feel, you know, happiness inside you that you are able to help someone. So it's not like entirely, you know, altruistic, you know, well, you have only the person you help. No, because you also are happier with what you feel. So in that regard, I guarantee you, I never uh, lose. Uh, and I just feel powerless, frustrated that I cannot do more as an individual. In my country, when I was president, I was accused, criticized by NGO civil society, as undermining justice, fomenting impunity. Why? Because as president, under the Constitution, I can pardon people who are in prison. Well, I pardon so many. The NGO said, President Ramos Orta, he pardoned left and right. He doesn't even bother reading the files. So he's undermining justice. I said, no, sorry, I do read. Uh, because, but in my country, justice doesn't work very well, and sometimes some of the, the sentences are too harsh. And that's why the Constitution gives the president the power to look at things, evaluate, and the only difference I did was I was proactive. I would send my staff to the prison to check, because if I did it, well, many people are forgotten in prison. Who is going to think of oh, some poor guy in prison who stole a buffalo or ten buffaloes? Well, so I send it. And then I told the, the people, listen, if my greatest sin in life is that I pardon too often, well, I'm happy to live with that sin. If that is my only sin, yeah, I'm very happy to have this, uh, this sinners of person by pardon, pardon too often. But sometimes I also get angry. Uh, I get angry with our youth because our youth, like youth in many countries, they say, we are the future, we are blah, blah, yeah. But then our youth are the first to destroy our environment. We go to the beach, who dump all the garbage at the beach. Well, not the elderly people, not the tourists, our youth. I always castigate them on television, on my speeches, I abuse them hoping that I shock them into realizing what they yeah, And I get very angry when, when I see this. <laughs> uh, you go to the beach in my country, you have garbage everywhere. Well, you go to India, you go to anywhere in Africa. In Africa with one exception, Rwanda, absolutely clean. Well, because you don't play around with Kagame. He shoots you if you don't behave. <laughs> so <laughs> Rwanda is very clean. And why Singapore is very clean? 
well, now everybody very disciplined, but 40 years ago, very dirty. And what Lee Kuan Yew did, well, with cunning, you know, uh, whipping up people on their little uh, skinny asses. So they start behaving. And sometimes I fantasize about introducing canning in Timor Leste. <laughs> the only problem is that we're so many, God, are we, are we going to can 500,000 people every day? So a very difficult enterprise. <laughs> so anyway, so that's, I get very, very angry sometimes. Yeah. So compassion and anger aren't mutually exclusive. More questions? Yes, please. <clears throat> My name is uh, Cedric Meyerhofer, I'm a junior doctor in the hospital. I would like to know what you think about uh, weapons or armed forces contributing to peace. Are they necessary or are they hindering the natural peace? Uh, weapons or uh, armed forces, military you, and weapons. If you use force to achieve peace. Use force. No, use armed forces, can they contribute to peace? Or, or should we achieve peace without armed forces? So w one question, maybe there are there any more in this area? or Yes, here in the front. Just wait for the microphone. Not for us, but for, for, for the other ones. Yeah? What what you, what you mean with with approach? Um, uh, I mean, uh, the point of view. On on the actual situation yes. or okay. Oh, oh. The Kurdish people. Oh. Okay. And maybe a third question there, and then we move back to the other side. Sorry, you, you, you say, uh, how, how, how should the use be brought on the right track? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Why also you think that right now we are so short-sighted? So short-sighted? Short-sighted, okay, okay. So we have uh, three uh, questions. The, the, third one, the third one is about why do you think that the use today is short-sighted? Yeah? And, and uh, how, how could this be changed? Um, the, the, the middle question was about uh, your stand on the Kurdish people, the situation today. And the first one was about the, the importance or non-importance of armed forces in achieving peace. To be a uh, first question, to, you know, we have to be realistic. For instance, in Rwanda, there was a genocide. I would have applauded if someone, let's say South Africa, uh, at the time uh, Mandela was already freed, he was a president of South Africa, Mandela had ordered South African troops because of the failure of Security Council in New York, South Africa, maybe in one or two more countries, had intervened outside the UN mandate to stop genocide in Rwanda. And the only possibility is armed intervention because those who are doing the genocide are using every kind of weapon uh, to kill, uh, and they end up killing 800,000 uh, people in the uh, space of six months. And so sometimes you have a you have a duty or obligation to uh, intervene, but the question always is, uh, and then the, the misuse of the so-called humanitarian intervention. So uh, it has to be extremely uh, well uh, uh, looked for each specific situation. Then you have uh, some people in South Sudan, I know some NGOs, one particular NGO called uh, Non-Armed Peacekeeping. As an American NGO, but with many volunteers around the world, I know them, I've met with them. They keep inviting me to visit them in South 
Sudan. I haven't been there. And uh, they're very courageous people. They are unarmed. They are in villages, in towns. And in many ways, they have saved thousands of lives without using arm, arms. Uh, but I told some of them, please just don't go to Syria, you know, with your uh, uh, approach. But they are in Syria, you know, in some areas of Syria. So I can only bow to uh, them, to their convictions and to their courage. But generally, in, uh, when you deal with, uh, you know, uh, there was some unbelievable, shameful failures by the UN. During a year or so ago, one of the worst massacres took place in South Sudan. Rebels entered a hotel where there were a lot of UN uh, civilian personnel, women. They raped women, they killed people there. UN peacekeepers from a number of nationalities were there and didn't lift a finger to go and intervene to try to stop one of the most abject failures of UN peacekeeping. But this happened also during the Bosnia war, one of the shameful uh, episodes of UN history happened in Bosnia when uh, UN was there and did not save, uh, allow thousands of people to be killed in uh, Bosnia. Second question was... Uh, the Kurdish people. The Kurdish. Looking from afar, at one level, one of the gravest injustices in uh, history is to the Kurdish people. These are very distinct people inhabiting four countries in the region from Turkey to Syria to Iran and uh, Iraq. Uh, when I read and watched uh, the Kurdish fighting for uh, freedom against ISIS, well, in many ways, sometimes it was the Iraqi army completely failed, fled, and uh, American forces couldn't do much. The Syrian army, uh, well, it was the Kurdish. What a valiant, brave people, particularly those women. So I have the greatest admiration for the Kurdish people, the Kurdish fighters. Having said that, the political leadership of the Kurdish people should be a bit wiser in negotiating with Iraq to try to find an arrangement that is acceptable to all. The referendum uh, I, because, you know, we had a referendum in my country, but the referendum was not unilateral done by us. After patient negotiation, lasting many years, Indonesia agreed, the UN organized the referendum, so we had a referendum. You know, unlike in Catalonia, you know, it was a referendum unilateral organized by the Catalan government uh, in the context of Spain, because Spain is still a sovereign entity, you know, so who should do the referendum? You don't do the referendum unilaterally. So you exacerbate the problem. It doesn't mean the Catalans don't have a legitimate grievance. So I would have said, you know, from a position of power, because the Kurdish acquired enormous moral political authority. It has powerful friends in Washington. Today I read a great article by John McCain, one of the greatest moral Republican force in the U.S. Congress, in the U.S., supporting the Kurdish. Well, so you have powerful friends. So you can negotiate from a position of strength with Baghdad to find an, uh, a solution that uh, is acceptable to Baghdad and to the Kurdish people, at least for the time being, for many years to come. In Turkey, it's a different situation. There was dialogue ongoing, then suddenly Erdogan changed his mind and unleashed war on the Kurdish. 
It's a pity, because Turkey is a major power in the region. We should not demonize Erdogan, should not demonize Turkey. Understand why they are doing this. So there has to be dialogue. That's why, you know, uh, countries like Switzerland, like uh, Norway and others, you know, should approach Turkey and find a resolution. Because can you imagine that enormous country? If something goes wrong, if Erdogan gets out of control, angry, he opened the floodgates to Europe of the two million refugees he's hosting. Well, it will be a catastrophe for Europe. He's not doing that. You know, they are shouldering the burden of the refugees from Syria. There has to be recognition of that. And of course there has been recognition, you know, uh, but there has been to be greater effort. And, but still the problem of the Kurdish in Turkey has to be addressed. And uh, so anyway, you know, uh, are you Kurdish? Uh, miss, Madame, you have a, I bow to you. What a great people you are. Yeah. I feel small, you know, in the face of the greatness of the Kurdish people. Now they're still the youth. The youth. Well, you know, I have to say, you know, uh, uh, what was the issue? There? The youth? About, about uh, I mean, why, why do you think they, they are short-sighted? <laughs> No, yeah. they, they it's youth, a follow-up to your earlier yeah. statement. No, the youth are not necessarily short-sighted. Uh, you know, uh, I have met brilliant youth like this today, this morning in uh, the international school here. It was in Basel. No, I have given so many talks that I forgot where I. Today, this morning, they are teenagers, so absolutely brilliant kids. Uh, age 15, they ask me smart questions. So uh, no, absolutely great people. I I just get angry in my own country when uh, the youth talk a lot, protest a lot, and they do a lot of damage to the environment, you know. Uh, so that's the, the only thing. But at the same time, our youth also uh, enormously generous and a very, very smart youth in my country. Uh, I have to say a story, you know, family story, personal story. A week ago, Myself, my brother, sisters, nephews, nieces, we have a, a lot of uh, people in the family. And we are very, my family, incredibly multiracial, multicultural. God, we have uh, people from every color, every background uh, in my family. And uh, my niece, who studying in Indonesia, in the Bandung Institute of Technology, they have an annual competition of the top five, ten universities. And my niece is studying, doing uh, uh, mechanic uh, design engineering, you know, I don't remember exactly the course. Well, she won first prize among all the competitors, among all the universities. The president of her university cried because first time her university won the prize. The president of the University of Indonesia, Universitas Indonesia, cried because first time they lost. <laughs> so, and then they went to my niece, the, all the television went to my niece, asked who she was, where she was from. She, she said, Saya Dari Timur, you know, I'm from Timor Leste. So everybody, in, because millions watch it, you know, they all shocked. So we have some brilliant young Timorese who get PhDs in China, in Chinese, in Korea. So, but we also have many fathers totally misbehave. <laughs> so, and uh, no, youth are great. We have to cherish the youth. We have to help them, give them the best possible education. But also human values. Our, the youth, I always tell the youth, study, study, and study. Not to be just good, to be better, but to be the very best. And for what purpose? To be selfish, to be vain? No. First, succeed, excel to be the pride of your parents, of your family, to be the pride of your town, your community, to be the pride of your country. Because, you know, when you have a... Can you imagine that woman from Myanmar, 
when I tell this story to some Burmese people, they are totally surprised. They didn't know these Burmese are top scientists, engineer in NASA, designing and helped you that she is the chief engineer of a team designing the helicopter. <laughs> and the, the Burmese totally surprised and incredibly proud. So when someone succeeds, our community is very proud. Well, he is one of ours. Well, he is from Basel, you know. Uh, he is from uh, 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 Surabaya. He is from uh, Kalimantan. Uh, he is from uh, in Lisbon or whatever. People very. <laughs> but and then what? Well, to serve the country, to serve humanity. So we we do something to try to help humanity, to help others. So we cherish the youth, the youth must study, must excel, so they contribute to a better world, to save lives, to be better medical doctors, to find cures, or to find you know, better solutions for agriculture. With climate change, we have to find better sources of water, because in the years to come, we will kill each other over water. More and more scarcity of water around the world. More and more scarcity of uh, Arab land because of drought. So people will kill each other over there. So it's incumbent on scientists to find better ways of growing food in arid lands. How to turn uh, salt water into drinking water, but without increasing the salinity of uh, Sea water, you know, because we, we, there's a lot of uh, desalinization going on. And where do you dump the salt? Back into the sea. And then do what? It will kill animal life uh, there because salinity increases. That I think my simplistic uh, understanding of it. So, um, <coughs> we've almost come to the end of this evening. When listening to some of your last remarks, uh, I thought it's actually a pity my family is not living in Basel because otherwise I would have invited you to talk to my kids too. And maybe you would be more successful than I am from time to time because I think uh, the challenges of the, of the youth in Timor-Leste are not so different than the challenges of the youth here. But it was also good to hear that you, you see the option for different measures how, how to motivate them uh, uh, for the future. Most of the time, I guess, in this room, we, we do have professors or, or other venerable academics uh, talking and, and discussing. Um, I think it's, it's very good and actually also absolutely necessary from time to time to have someone who comes from outside of the narrow environment of academia but who is still very much anchored in many institutions and, and processes which are being studied within academia. And uh, when listening to Jose Ramos Horta, we realized in how many processes and institutions, but also in how many topics and thematic areas he has been active during his whole life. And still, I think we can still very much feel the politician, but also the fighter. I mean, fighting is not only with military violence, you can also fight with, with civilian means for certain ideas and even ideals. And linked to this, and this is my last point, I think it was also possible for us tonight, at least for me, to feel the person behind all of this. I like very much the question about the compassion. I think you liked it too because um, uh, it allowed you to say something more also about uh, yourself, your motivations. And then we see that actually it's not so important in how many institutions and processes you're, you're active. What's important is that you remain more or less yourself and that you continue to be engaged uh, at different times, in different continents, in different frameworks. And I would like to also thank all of you for the excellent questions uh, which have been asked, not all of the questions 
could be asked, but it's, uh, it's better like this than if the moderator has desperately to look out for questions and ends up asking additional questions himself. I think this is the best tribute which could be paid to your presentation. Your Excellency, thank you very much once more for having spent this evening with us here at the University of Basel and thank you also very much to the Asia Society Switzerland for having rendered possible um, uh, this evening and I think, well, you deserve some clappings. Thank you.